what is the conceptual the philosophy behind like Islamic geometry? What is the philosophy behind ancient Egyptian philosophy? If we ever have a bad version of the AI, it's because we are ourselves are bad. It's not the fault of AI, it will be our fault. If the AI is alien, it's because we're treating it as such, or like we are using it in such a manner. Welcome to PA Talks, uh, a podcast where we dive deep into the ever-evolving world of architecture, design, and technology. I'm Hamita Sanzade, your guide into this captivating journey. Today, we have the privilege of introducing Hassan Ragab, a rising star in the realm of architectural conceptualization, where he explores the limitless possibilities of AI-driven design ideas. Hassan is an architect, interdisciplinary designer, and visionary artist with 15 years of expertise spanning various domains. He's a pioneer in blending identity, beauty, and technology using AI. Breaking free from the confines of four follows function Hassan. He founded Hassan Ragab Studio in January 23, focusing on interdisciplinary design and generative art. Hassan's work transcends borders, encompassing architecture, art exhibitions, storytelling, heritage preservation, and more. He's also a talented instructor in PA Academy, where he has taught stunning AI sessions with Mid Journey. Join us as we explore Hassan's career and his visions for the future of AI in architecture. Okay, welcome Hassan. Thank you so much for joining to PA Talks. Thank you, Aida. Like it's always great to talk to you, and uh, feel, it's such a pleasure to be here with you. Yeah, it's good to have you. Nice. So we've been collaborating for so long, and you've been teaching so many workshops and attending all our events as a jury, as a speaker, and now it's uh, time to do a longer version talk with you and put it out there so people can see, can hear more things about you. Who's Hassan? Where is, where is he coming from? What's his inspirations? Maybe we can start the conversation, Elbert, with uh, focusing on your background. Where are you from? Where are you now? What are you doing? And where did you study architecture? Yeah. So, yeah, I'm... Uh, so, my name is Hassan. Like, one of the things that keeps, like... I don't know, I keep questioning myself about is, like, how people, uh, like, say my name. So, it's Hassan. And it's something that I get like used to here, but it's a very uh, profound question because it's part of like my identity. But again, on the other hand, there's a lot of names that I can't say properly. So there's like this confusion between should I like live as Hassan or Hassan? But Hassan and... is a quite uh, common name. Like it's being used in the entire Middle East region. It's as uh, it's a. Uh, and the old Islamic countries have it. And even so many of European and Western culture, we have Hassan as a name. Uh, I don't know, maybe it's uh, uh, the immigrants or something, but I've quite heard Hassan so many so many places. Yeah, yeah, no, it's true. I think people like don't like they don't find it weird. I think they're fine with the name. It's about like spelling the name. So and it I think it goes down to how I am like um uh, typing my name in English, like I'm typing it wrong, like compared, like it, it just, I, th I think I should have put it in like H A S E N, so it will be Hassan or Hassan, but Hassan. I put it Hassan, so that's the problem. Right, right. Um, Hassan. Yeah. <laughs> and also your so, yeah. last name, Ragab. Ragab, yeah, well, perfect, yeah. yeah. Ragab. Ragab is even harder for people. <laughs> it's, yeah, and I, I think it's not a problem with, like, the name itself, but it's more of, like, you know, your identity and basically what th one, one of the things that I'm learning with, like, you know, with design and architecture and AI is, like, ident identities are really, really important. And maybe we'll talk about this later. And, like, yeah, to start with, I'm, I'm Egyptian. I have... I was born and raised in Alexandria. Uh, it's like, I don't know, like it's one of my favorite places in the world. And it has a lot of effects on me. Uh, just like seeing how the urban changes, how the buildings are changing. The whole dynamics, it's it's a very um, interesting experience to live in Egypt during like the, like the 80s, the 90s, and then the 2000s, and then come here to the United States. So yeah, I lived there most of, of my my life. I went to school there in the Faculty of Fine Arts. Uh, I studied architecture for five years. 
I always didn't like the curriculums that we had in <laughs> architectural schools. <laughs> I was always this like real person. What was person. the worst thing that you hated? <laughs> I think I don't know. Um, it just like it like what the curriculums didn't make any sense. You know, like for example, like in the first year they teach this. They teach uh, Greek Roman architecture. Not Egyptian, not ancient Egyptian, not Islamic, and you had to like to do it like manually, so you had to draw it by hand. They didn't allow us to use computers up to the second year, and we're talking about this is like the 2006, 2007. So you already have like BIM, and you already have like 3D Max, and you keep hearing about these things outside of like school, which is like, what what's wrong? I I doesn't it doesn't make it didn't make any sense. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense. And uh, I actually got really, really frustrated because, like, I f remember, like, in the second year, I tried to become, like, this really, really good student and, like, attend all the lectures, uh, stop being rebel, like, do, like, you know, like, do my work, like, in the perfect way. And, like, within three or four months, like, I started to question, like, this, this is wrong. And I, th I actually started thinking about maybe I should switch from architecture because this is not great. But then, like, one day, there was, like, uh, an extracurricular lecture. So this is something that you didn't need to attend. And I actually stopped attending most of the lectures. I would, like, I don't know, go out or, like, I don't know, like, you know, go take a Spanish course or something. And everybody just thought, like, I'm crazy. And then, like, there was one lecture uh, that was about parametric design. This was in 2008. And this was, like, the first time that I hear, like, that you can use code in design. And at that point, it felt like this is pretty, pretty cool because it also like it's the lecture was very, very interesting because it's also talked about the um, the history of technology in architecture. And this is something I've never heard before, you know, like, yeah, you, you hear about like, you know, like Frank Gehry and so on. But, you know, like that Frank Gehry and Zahadi, they drew, they have like these weird shapes. And then you go into 3D Max and you model these crazy shapes and that's it. And it just like. Yeah, okay, uh, then what else? Finished. But now you learn, yeah, learn about coding, and that's really interesting. And then it's like in, in 2008, that was in 2008, I tried to like learn coding at that point. I, I did, it didn't really work out for me. Or like I didn't know where, what to do, you know. Like there was no like base geometry modeling a course that I could take or even look, look up on YouTube. And then in 2009, I discovered Dra Grasshopper. And this was like very, yes, very early legendary. on Grasshopper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it it before Grasshopper, I, I think it was called Explicit History. Yes, yes, so, that's right. Um, yeah, yeah, and that's like at that point when I discovered Grasshopper, it was like, this is awesome. Like this, I really <laughs> want to learn this. Like you know, like understand more what's going on. Um, yeah, but then and I remember like I was the first one in my university to use Grasshopper in their design projects. I even, I, it was so absurd that I even, like, uh, took a snapshot of the Grasshopper script and formula and I put it, like, you know, <laughs> in the project. That was how absurd it is. Wow, that's great. I think uh, <laughs> the first days of the explicit history, uh, so I discovered Grasshopper less, uh, much later, I think around 2010-11, and I, I didn't work on it uh, for some time, but... I remember those uh, those days. Some some of the guru designers and architects uh, who were older than us, they were all showcasing. Look at this too. Look at this too. <laughs> but yes, those first days are the, the they were the days uh, nobody knew about it, and there was less resources. There were less resources to learn to share, and also. Uh, by the time that it passed, uh, the forums, the community, they helped each other in completing the the dots and putting everything together, and also the plugins and everything clusters. These kind of help to form a much larger uh, framework. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was crazy. Yeah, I think like at that point, I think I started learning Grasshopper for like two books. The one was called Primer, and the other one, I don't remember the title, but it was by, uh, I think, a guy from Iran who was called... Um, Jubin Khabbazi. 
Yeah, Habazi, yeah. Yeah, he's one yeah. of the first yeah, people yeah, he's, who wrote Yeah, like, he's like a pioneer. Yeah. Yes, yes. Morpha- yeah, it was great. Yeah, what was a morphogenesis of the geometry or something? Like, maybe we can put the Zubin Habazi's book in the description so people can check. I'm, I'm not sure about the name of it. I think yeah. the world owns this, uh, to owns like the whole computational like, community owns like a yes. lot of their knowledge to, to this guy, yes, in my yes. opinion. Exactly. That, yeah, that was the dark days, <laughs> you know, like, no <laughs> YouTube, nothing. And also, like, I remember like in 2011 or 12, I don't remember when Daniel Piker released Kangaroo. And yes. at that point, it was just, oh my god, that was fascinating. And, uh, yeah, yeah, it, it's yeah, like... Jubin's, Jubin's book is called uh, Generative Algorithms. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And there was also another book talking about mathematics and architecture. Oh my god, I haven't read these books in like 11 years. It was by a lady. I, I think she has like, she's either Arabian or like Middle Eastern. She had like a, some form of like an Arabic name. Um... So yeah, like again, you do these, but again, you study these books and you do nothing with them in Egypt in 2010. So I, at that point, I worked in exhibition design and museography because like one, like I, when I was in third uh, year of school, I helped one architect in their project in like a competition, national competition project for a museum for Gamal Abdel Nasser, who is like a profound president in Egypt. And we, when I was in the third year, I won that competition actually, or like our group won this competition and this was great. And then when I graduated, I, I didn't know what to do. So I worked in that. Um, so I worked in museography for about five years. And on the other hand, I was like teaching grasshopper, like individually. I was, it was so funny that I ended up teaching grasshopper to my professors, like the, my professors in school. Now I was teaching them. Which is, yeah, that was really interesting. So yeah, I did that for about five years. And I've been like trying to research like, yeah, you know, computational design. I'm trying to do digital fabrication with CNC machines. I even, I tried to go study abroad. So I applied to ICD, the very first program of ICD in 2013. And uh, I think the program, they accepted only 15 people. And I was one of the people they got accepted. And I was like really, really happy. But unfortunately, I couldn't go because I didn't have money. And I I wasn't doing very good at school. So I didn't get a scholarship, which is like, yeah, that was uh, such a disappointment. But yeah, but after that, I ended up doing a couple of projects like especially design projects in Dubai, in Qatar, in Egypt, uh, doing workshops. I did a workshop in uh, IAC in Barcelona in 2011. So like I've been trying to explore this whole computational design realm on my own very, very randomly. Um, until like 2015, I didn't want, ah, like I didn't want to study or like this to work in exhibition design anymore. So I started my own design studio that made computational design furniture. Like in a, it's basically like a mid-century furniture with a twist of like computational design. And this was like a, a pretty new thing in Egypt back then. I don't know if it was in the world. No, no the, I think the world like by that time it caught up with the whole computational design thing. And you can see like furniture. But in Egypt it wasn't that case. And yeah, it, like I spent like two years on that. It didn't go well. And then I had like opportunity to come here to the United States with my wife in 2018. And again, I was very lucky to work uh, as a computational designer here in the United States. And within four months, I mean, it was a very, very happy coincidence. And uh, I didn't, I couldn't find a job at the beginning because I'm Egyptian. I didn't study in uh, in in the U.S. or like uh, you know Europe, and nobody knew me. So like all the companies was kind of really, really. Uh, I don't know, afraid to hire me, like or like they were a little bit cautious. Even my company was a little bit cautious, but like my company, like Martin Bros, it was great actually. Like my boss Andrew was was a great person, and like it's like they wanted people to who have like a mix between digital fabrication uh, and computational design, you know, like mix. And you know, like I was at the right place at the right time, so I think I was lucky. And uh, I worked at the Lucas Museum of Narrative Arts. I don't know if you know that project. Like, it was by Med Architects. Uh, it's I in think, downtown yeah, I Los know Angeles. It. Yes, I know it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I worked on that for, like, about three or four years. Um, and, again, like, I, I, th- I, that's, that I was working, like, as a computational design in construction. And that's something that you would often see, 
like an architect working in construction. And I think that was a very, very interesting thing to do because you can really get some hands on um, like what you see from the buildings like that were being built by Zahadid. Uh, outside of like the architectural perspective, like how to build these things, what it takes to actually build these things. So this was like a great experience. Like, but it was also like a very philosophical experience for me because, it, although I worked in construction, it's actually where I learned design, if that makes sense, or like learned how it to totally judge. Totally makes design. sense. Yes, yes. How yeah. to design things that are buildable. <laughs> Or not just build. Yeah, it's not also buildable. I think we can build everything. Like working in construction, we ha we now have the capacity. If you can visualize it, you can build it. You will. You have the math. You have the good structure. You you have everything that make you able to build these kind of buildings. But the problem is, should we build these buildings? And what are the impacts that we are doing by building these buildings? And you know, like, again, like, at that period, I wasn't very creative. Like, all my work was basically, like, I was working with Grasshopper to, like, to create codes and plugins and tools, like, to, like, very crazy tools. Uh, we were doing things that, like, out of the playbook. So we did, like, we, we ended up, like, trying to create our own plugins to kind of solve the issues that we we're working on in the field. Yeah. And then, but again, I, I didn't really like it because I always like to imagine things and be creative. And this job wasn't really creative. And I always like I've been also always been following like the developments of AI, but like from a distance because I just didn't have time to train my own GANs basically. So you see like the people, and you know I hear like the lectures of Matthias Locambo and other people like talking about how AI is going like to uh, be the future of architecture and what's being ha what's happening. And you see like Rafik Rafik uh work for Zahadid and these sorts of things. And you say yeah okay, this is cool, but. I can go into that realm, but then I saw like this called Midjourney last year, and uh, Midjourney and Dali basically. But Dali didn't give me access at the beginning. Midjourney was like the people who allowed me to so, get so access. So, how children. did you how did you get into AI? Like, what is the story of getting into AI? How, how did you discover the Midjourney or any AI software that you're using now? Or what? Well, how did your interest emerge with AI? Um, yeah, it's just like, yeah, I've been interested like for a while, but I just couldn't get my hands into it again, because like, I guess like my start, my interest in AI started in 2021, but this is actually, we're talking about only looking at videos at YouTube that, uh, you know, like, like, uh, explain how neural work, uh, neural networks work basically, which for me, you just watch, watch it like that. Like, I have no idea what's going on. Like. And I don't think I'm able to kind of develop my own thing, you know, like I'm that not that good at data science and coding to build my own thing. So it's it's always been interesting for me to understand how AI works. But then, like, I think I discovered Midjourney and Dali on social media. I started to see these weird images. But this was like early on before these things became public. I don't remember who. I think one of the earliest people that were working with it was Matthias Del Campo and I think Andrew Cuddles. I think these people like were like the real people who kind of started everything. But at that point, like nobody like knew what the hell is going on, and the people look at, at the images and just like scroll away because it looked weird. But for me, it's just like okay, this looks really. Weird. I have never seen anything like that before. Like mid journey. Like we're talking about B1 and B2, where like you can barely understand anything that's in the image. So yeah, I just like tried to look up like what tools to be used, and there were a couple of tools, but Midjourney like seemed like really really interesting. But at that point, you have to be invited. So I applied, like I sent him an email, or, like, or I think there was a forum that you can apply to get early access or so. I did that, and I did that for Delhi too, and it took them like two weeks, and then they sent me an invite, and. Uh, yeah, I remember like you get like 25 free trials before you actually subscribe. But I remember I, f I subscribed from my first image because like, you know, I don't, you know, like I think <laughs> it's just it it was weird. Like, you know, you just like the type of weird that in a minute you get an image that wasn't there. And it's at that point I, I feel like, hey, this is good. This is huge. This like I, I need to really focus on this. I really need to know what to make out of this. So um, yeah, I think I didn't start, I didn't stop like using AI ever since. 
uh it became like an obsession and i just didn't know why like i like it seemed i i started to lose sleep over how this thing is revolutionary and uh yeah and i just i don't know i just started posting on instagram i think i when i started posting i, I don't know i probably had like 400 followers at that point and i think they were all my friends i don't think there was anybody special um and i just like started posting it because i wanted to communicate with people who works with ai you know just like you know i'm seeing them like putting up their experiments and i thought yeah let's put it like you know and get in touch and actually that worked like uh, at the beginning i got in touch with a lot of people for example like kyle steinfeld and uh you know other people who've been working like with it like will garner or tim or you know joshua or um so like yeah you start connecting with people but then you like these like you now you get more interest with like every time i post now you get more interest uh like you know like people start follow you more and you start to get commissions and you start to get interviews and we're talking which is weird for me like it was very very weird <laughs> i remember whenever we, uh, the, the moment uh we connected on instagram i think i i, I messaged you from pa uh, for a possible collaboration and we wrote an article together you wrote an article and we published on PA your views on on Mid Journey and the ti- the topic of the title of article was a Mid Journey to the World of Hassan Ragab <laughs> or a journey inside the parentheses yeah Mid Journey to the World of Hassan Ragab and it had a lot of views on our website and got so many so many clicks uh, of course the work was good and the 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 uh, the article were was worth reading and well informed uh, information well well written information but also the title affected that as well you are you were a computational designer before ai and you work with multiple parametric and computational softwares and uh, you 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 had hands on these type of advanced tools in architecture so or advanced tools and design process, let's say. How do you think is AI is being used these days in the creative industry? And what is the process that we are now trying to integrate it with, with our industry? Hmm. That's where it gets philosophical for me. So I think when, like, there's a different, I think there's a big, difference that everybody kind of there's a misconception between ai and text to image or text to video basically and if you're talking about the integration of ai in architecture so this is something this is something that has been happening um even before mid journey and stable diffusion but now it's taking like a different shape and uh, there's a boom like and discovering like diffusion models that now everybody wants like to integrate it in their process so i think as we speak, AI is being integrated in the architectural process in almost every stage. So I've attended like a lot of talks last year uh, and I attended a lot of conferences and almost every big company, you're talking about the big players, but even like the the medium, the middle players, but even like, but the big players are integrating AI into like, you know, like conceptualization using text to image, but they also using diffusion models for st- structural stability, for um, documentation, for like solving um, issues with like, or like or b- basically creating plans and sections, a uh, documentation or even project management. So that's some, not something that is going to happen in the future. This is already being implemented now. And there are, there are a lot of like startups, architectural startups, who are keen on integrating AI into architecture. Image, like what I do basically, or like how I see like image, like um, generative AI as a way of consultation or like a way of imagination, let's say, yeah, my my main my main question was also about uh, text to image or conceptualization because right now creative industry is uh, mostly focused in this part of AI in architecture or AI in and uh, in, 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 in design industry. Yes, but for now it's in the conceptualization stage, text to image. But for sure, we're gonna have much better and much more comprehensive AI tools embedded in in our profession. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I think we have it now. 
And I think that's the problem. I think, like, when I first started using Midjourney and Stable Diffusion, I immediately understood that these are not architectural tools. These are artistic tools. And for me, I thought this is a very good way to, like, question architecture, question the practice that we're talking about right now. Because one thing about architects, like, one problem about architects is that they think a lot about architecture and neglect everything else. One example is that, you know, like in a movie, everybody sees architecture in the background and you see people like in front, but not the architects. Architects, they ignore people, they ignore everything and they only look at architecture. So we have, I think like most architects have this narrow focus on details and how to build things in a very efficient way. You know, like it's almost like a tradition. You have a tradition as an architect, you are, you are trained in a certain way and you're exposed to certain things and you apply the, the technologies too in a in like in a very specific way but ai or like basically generative ai give us the opportunity to go beyond that to see architecture that is just more than what we have and question what we have i think like ai is just like zaha hadid when she first started like basically zaha hadid is like inspired by avant grand russian uh, artistic uh, like art uh, art art movements and I think like probably Zahadi spent like when she first opened her studio maybe she spent like nine years not having any clients not winning any competitions and she was just teaching and showing her work in exhibitions because and I think like she didn't really care about the details she didn't really take really care about how to apply like the details of the orchestra she thought as an artist basically and and that's opened the, the the door to new meaning, or like new visuals and new ideas, whether they're good or bad. But like this is novelty. This is true novelty here. I think AI allows us to do the same thing because it get it get us away from like the traditional learning. You get exposed to so many new things, uh, or photography uh, and art. You're not talking only about visual because art is like more sensible. So. Architects have always tried to like evoke emotions using abstraction and geometry. Art can be a little bit more direct. So now, if you can combine that with architecture, you have an maybe you have something that's really really interesting. So, but unfortunately, I don't think that's how it's being used right now. And I think this is because of the development of the AI softwares themselves. So, like the more that you get photorealistic models, the more that architects want to like us architects. I think everybody wants to like get these tools to work in their old domains or like with all with their old processes basically integrate ai into creating something that is being created already and this is great of course i i think that's a good use but also like we're missing a big opportunity on like how we can really question the problems that we have in architecture right now and it seems like nobody's looking at these problems. AI helps me, at least like me, myself. It helps me question these ideas. It helps me know like, hey, what's wrong with architecture and how can I highlight that? How can I become a more aware of like what's going on? For sure, that's the creative side of it. And if we want to focus on how we do architecture these days, and uh, there are so many um, repetitive tasks and many of much of the things that we do can be done uh, automatically, can be automated. How much, uh, how, what kind of percentage do you think, what percentage of an architect's job could be automated with AI, do you think? Uh, we're talking about the future, right? Yes, uh, probably. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, I think it will be 100%. 100% of an architect's job could be automated. Why not? Yeah, I don't it know, could like, be, of course. Yeah, it's just like when you think about it, like, what is the architect's job? Maybe that's maybe that's the question, like, what architects do? But like this question has like two like two sides. Like the side is like you know the utopian side was like the architect is the master builder. He's the creator of the world. He can imagine like new new future, like a better future, and he builds for the people and the, for for the like the wellness of everybody and so on. The reality is so much different and nobody speaks about it. So like everybody, everybody who goes on Instagram, you see these 
cool buildings or great buildings or like we attend conferences and we hear about like where's like sustainability and wellness and bright future and you know like efficiency and less carbon footprint but that's not what happens in the architectural practice like i i i worked in like three continents continents uh, in architecture i practice architecture three continents i have friends who work in almost every important city that is building architecture We're talking about many regions talking about us um, england or like europe in general china nobody is happy <laughs> like yeah architects are very miserable because they are not being creative they are not they are not well paid they have terrible life balance but the worst part is is that they are just replicating a certain type of architecture which is like a postmodernism or post digital architecture which is like form follows function and right now the function is money so like the client needs to have like to be happy and for the client to be happy you will do whatever that you can do you ignore the nature you ignore uh, you know the wellness of the people which is like very very important uh, and you will do anything just like to get a, a legible building, like building that meets the code and a building that, you know, is money. And that is the type of architecture right now that nobody speaks about. Like the world is not full of, uh, I don't know, like natural built buildings from Adobe that like Rome, like, uh, like Royale's buildings or like it, like Arthur, Mam uh, Arthur Mamoni is not building his like, you know, recycle very, very interesting recycled materials everywhere in the world. No, that's that's not the world of architects right now. Architects are either now building that, or like they're building the metaverse, or they're creating images in AI. And this is the future of architects. And yeah, and coming back to the conversation, all these things are mathematics. They are all logics. They are not really creative. AI can do this much better than any human so why we'll not? see we'll see <laughs> <laughs> i'm not sure of that but uh we'll see yeah what because... do you think yeah like, yeah let me know what you think, what do you think? No, let I, me ask you the same question i i, I read there i read an article uh which was written around 2013 and it was published in one of the scientific magazines uh it was basically the uh, evaluation of uh jobs and around the year 2030, which um, a group of scientists, uh, two students, a PhD students probably, uh, if I remember r correctly, they have uh, analyzed 700 jobs and uh, uh, they have created a computerization factor for these 700 jobs that the most number close to one could have 100% computerization factor and uh, could be easily automated by any bot algorithm or any uh, physical robot maybe, or like, a, uh, you know, vacuum cleaner and robo uh, cleaners, something like that. And on top of the list was the cashiers, the, you know, the cleaners and all those bunch of guys who are like, like, obviously no no disrespect to any any job or any person those type of the work, things that require less knowledge and less talent to do the work will lose their job for computerization and the factor was 99 0.99 and as you move down to la to the bottom of the list uh you see like computer uh, computer uh, you see like engineering drafting and architectural drafting, which has 0.45%, if I recall correctly, which has like a 50% of losing their jobs in the U.S. market by the 2030 to an automated system. And architectural designing and creative industry had a factor of 0.05 which was like 5% by highly likely to be automated or to be replaced by a robot or a, uh, by a bot or an algorithm. The least computerized factor was 0.005, which was belonged to 
uh, archaeologists and this one was very a tough job that needed so many so many knowledge about the human history human background and the site and everything that could be done by a robot or an algorithm or a bot I, I'm just relying to a, a scientific article that was published right uh, in a scientific magazine. Uh, based on that, I think the architecture and architecture is not just about creating visuals. Architecture is not just about uh, creating renderings. It's not about drafting. It's not about uh, uh, coding or computation. It's not about getting clients or building or being a site architect. Architecture is all of these. And it's all the com combination of all these activities that make an architect architect. But it's also a group work. But when it comes to the creative creative industry, the design point, yes, we can see that the, there are some bots now are creating much better visuals than a human imagination with the given tools, the given words. Uh, you know that we have done so many, so many courses in the past two years with about AI, you, uh, Tim, Hassan, Car you, Tim, Carlos, Arturo, Aida, so many of these creative talents. And I, I, I know uh, I've seen how, how you guys operate. And this is a very... Uh, you guys are pioneering and mastering the art of engineering and bringing the things that is somehow out of imagination of people probably or out of the imagination of any human and bringing it into a visual format. It's a great work. But this is not alone is just an architecture. I believe it's a creative industry, which is a great conceptualization and ideation process is very highly valuable valuable but the uh, architecture means something like bringing something into also a physical world and building it and to do that it requires so many other parameters i don't say it's not going to be automated but there will be tools that will be automated for our industry and it will save us a lot of time and they will uh just be our a savior angel to not to focus on the boring side of the job rather than just focusing on the high quality relationships with the uh, with the users high quality understanding of the environment and also uh, understanding of the requirements of the client and also delivering the best project that part of the job that we're doing now the ideation and conceptualization is maybe 10 percent of the whole architecture what about the other 90 percent what about the uh, the communication between engineers what about other other things and i also completely agree with whatever you said at the beginning about uh, if you are now imagining something definitely you can build that that idea definitely you can build that project we have good technologies right now we can build so many so many complicated forms even quite three-dimensional uh, surfaces anything but yeah my, my point on architectural uh job and being automated is it's a little, a little bit tough tough uh, profession to be automated but there will be automated tools that will help architects to enhance their work quality and you see that we, we don't have like work that work life balance as you mentioned we are miserable as shit <laughs> but but uh i hope it will help someday for us it will be a good help for us yeah, well, I think I think the problem or like maybe like my question or like my, maybe my answer wasn't really around how AI will take over like the architect's job, but mainly questioning what is the architect's job right now, basically, you know, what has it turned to? That's maybe like the, the problem. I mean, the AI will basically replace the architect's role if the architect's role stayed the same. Which is, you can see it, like with the development of AI, you can see it, like architects. I think the great thing about AI is that it, it, it should 
be helping architects not to think as architects. You know, as an architect, like you said, you think about the bigger picture, right? But because architecture is like very, very, a very, very intensive practice, we tend to lose this bigger picture. So now you have like this of rules of like, you don't have the term architect right now. You have like an architectural designer and you have like an architectural engineer and you have like a site engineer. You don't have one person that does all this. And I'm saying that because I worked in all this. I've basically, I was very lucky that in my career, I almost did all of these things. To connect them together in, in, in one practice, it's a really hard job. And you can do it with AI. But then it's your responsibility to use AI to push the boundaries of what you can create, not to replicate what you're doing. And from what I'm seeing, like, again, like, I think this is all comes down to, like, how AI, how technology, how people use technology in general, not only in architecture. They don't use it for, like, the well-beings of, like, the people. They always, like, use it to I see. make I see. more money, I guess. Maybe we, we should uh, use the term AI architect. <laughs> I hate future. it. I, oh, my God. I hate it. When somebody tells me I'm an AI guy. I don't know. I even don't consider myself an architect anymore. You know, like yeah. right now, like when my, my biography, the first thing I saw, I put like designer and artist. I'm, I, I can't yeah. say what I'm doing. is What I'm doing is not architecture. Yeah. We, uh, like. Let's yeah. say that. It's architectural philosophy. AI basically. artists? What about AI artists? You hate that too? <laughs> I hate it. I, I mean, I, I understand what it means and like as a differentiation, but the problem is there's a lot of stigma to being called like AI artist. Um, it's just uh, limiting, yeah. limiting yourself, I, I believe. There, there was a period people were using meta architect <laughs> when the it's metaverse art. was so high. <laughs> I think it tells a lot. I I think when it's important to the yeah, well, so cool. yeah, yeah. I think the problem that yeah, no worries. I think it's a problem when you call yourself an AI artist because now you're limiting yourself. When people say that you're an art an AI artist, it might give them a context. However, like I see a lot of people who use AI, I don't associate myself with them. I don't. I try to like yeah, I'm not doing the same thing. You know, it's like two people using AutoCAD and one is building. I don't know, like. No, that's a bad example. Actually, forget that. But yeah, I just like yeah, I'm using I'm using a different. Uh, I I don't like the word basically. No, it's again like you said, it's like very limiting and it's very, yeah, it's it doesn't give you the whole context of what you do basically. Like if you're an AI artist or like architect, okay, what are you creating? Like as an architect, like you can be like uh, building museums, you can be building I don't know hospitals, you could be. A researcher, you know, there's a lot of things that goes under the same umbrella. Art is a very, very big umbrella, and now you put AI artists, that's like very limiting, in my opinion. What's the message behind Hassan Ragab's works? It's mainly exploring, if I have to say, but uh, I'm mainly exploring like myself. I'm exploring what I like and what I love, and uh, exploring. Trying to have like more, <clears throat> excuse me. Trying to have more meanings uh, of w what I create. So it's not just I, I don't know if I need to convey a message. However, like with using AI, I think there. I feel like I need to convey the message that we need to become more human beings, if that makes sense, and uh, be more empathetic. But again, I think like the main thing is like I like to explore. How does your Egyptian background feed your storytelling? Um, I think I'm very, very lucky to be an Egyptian architect. Although I didn't study like a lot of, like there's a lot of complexity that goes around like Egyptian architecture. And I'm, by Egyptian, I'm not meaning only ancient Egyptian. You have so many layers, like, you know, almost every country invaded us. <laughs> that's, <laughs> almost, I think, yeah. like, yeah, almost, yeah. Uh, but uh, <laughs> like, yeah, which is very interesting and sad, like, you but know. true. Yeah, but but you, you have you, a silver but, lining for it. Yeah, but but your your uh, works about Egypt, uh, the ones that you did, even I think a couple of them uh, with version three were mind blowing, and those houses with yellow color, they were just amazing. And uh, you did after that a couple of. A, a couple of them more and which purely shows you how you are being fed with your uh, cultural aspects 
being an Egyptian and using them in a proper way to showcase and visualize an idea and tell a story actually tell a story in a image format how, how, how are you doing this or how is this uh affecting your your visualization and using ai in this way uh, i'm just trying to like not again i'm trying to think of the entire perspective like you said like it's a storytelling it's basically i think each it's not only like architecture is visual you know design is visual and it kind of, it will tell something whether you like it or not you, it will tell something and um yeah it's just i'm i'm trying to like draw from from my background because it's again it's a way to understand who i am so basically before i design or like as an architect i'm always trying to look for ways to create something that is valuable or like it, it, that has a value to me i think art i think basically like if i'm an architect i've always had like the question of like what am i am i an architect or not I, like i i as a person as an architect i hated to do like architectural drawings that was not like my favorite thing and like solving details i i really didn't like that i liked more like to un like to do concepts you know build like weird things or like design weird things uh at in school they always thought i was crazy and uh yeah which is very funny but i think i've i always had this thing about like trying to understand like uh what i can create what's new that i can do and eventually that led me up to Okay, if I want to do something new, I need to first understand who I am and where I'm coming from. And maybe because I'm in the United States and I'm a little bit homesick, I don't know. It made me contemplate a little bit more about like my life, basically, like my my childhood, my upbringing, my education in Egypt, about Egypt in general. And this has like a great impact on me to try to reach out for those, both like artistically and also like in research wise. So I'm. I'm now reading more. So when I started using AI, I was reading a lot about like technology, AI, the future. Now I read more about history and like whether it's like history of Egypt, like different parts of like, you know, the history, not only architecture, but also like the creator context. And it's just amazing. And it's almost endless. You're talking about like, I don't know, 4000 years of like history, like deep, deep history and conflicts with many con neighboring countries and the world. And this has like all of these kind of mixed together in to my work, basically. It's also tried to reflect on like current events or like life in Egypt now or in the world right now. And I think this is really helping me develop my visual vocabulary outside of like walls, outside of doors, outside of, outside of windows. Now you talk about like, okay, there is a history, there are more dynamics that was before modernism, you know, basically like how how what is the conceptual the philosophy behind like islamic geometry what is the philosophy behind ancient egyptian philosophy what is uh hieroglyphics uh resemble like what they what do they mean how we can reinvent them in a way that is not westernized in a way that is not modernized a way that is more suitable to our culture and our, our identity or at least mine so i think that's what is affecting my work in a in a way right now that's where I'm heading. Yeah. And uh you so so you're conveying a message through your uh stories and through your visuals. How do you think people should communicate uh, other people should communicate their own messages through this kind of visualization and ideation? How to find their own path and how to uh be able to prompt engineer let's say prompt engineer they, their thing rather than the technical aspects of learning how to uh do prompting what about the the story that everyone themselves that they want to uh go and explore like things that you said right now here i mostly understand this message that rather than exploring ai this is a self-exploration exploring yourself and finding out who you are and basically upon that you can definitely uh, discover what are your intersects what are your main focuses what what would you, what would you want to tell to the world and on 
on that note, what would you what do you think how uh, young creatives should focus on the storytelling? I think it all starts with questioning, I guess. It's and that's like the hardest part about like being a creative, whether you're an artist or an architect. It's really hard to stay true to yourself because the world you know, like this, the world goes with a certain dynamics. Like you need to get a job, and the job sometimes won't adhere to your beliefs, or they won't adhere to your background. And then you will have to change as a person or as an artist, and you then you will lose your identity. I think that's the main issue. Um, if I think everybody should stay true and also try to understand that. Whether it's computational design, whether it's AI, whatever that you're using, it's just tools. And the problem with like most like young architects or even like big architects now, they think of the tools as a mean, not a tool. Like they think about it as an end result. So everybody wants to create the best image that, that they can do with AI or that, that they need to design the most computationally designed looking building in a way because it's now the mean. What actually, like, if you want to be authentic, you need to use these as more of a tools for your own, for your own vision. And that's like the advantage that the AI gives to the, crea to the creatives it, that they have complete freedom to do whatever that they want very, very quickly, very, very conceptually. Uh, without like trying to spend too much time in the technicalities, and also like like you said, like the AI, the tools, like basically, if we're talking about like uh, generative AI, text to image or prompting in general, they are starting to losing their technical aspects. So it, now it's much easier to create images than before. Right now, like if like at the beginning, like when I first like gave like a um, a workshop with PA, like. Doing a prompt was really, really complicated. It wasn't that easy, at, or at, not that complicated. But I think it, it's much easier than like Grasshopper, of course. But it was just harder than now. Now you just like type, "I want a great building," and it'll just like get a very futuristic, very, very nice image. Before that, it was really, really, really hard. So that means that you should really invest more into your ideas or into your, um, I don't know, like exploring. Uh, philosophically and and abstractly, what do you want to create? Because the tools will do it for you. Basically, that's returning to like the the role of the architects uh, that we were talking about. Like you know, AI will replace architects if they are not creative. Most of the most of what I'm seeing right now that architects are not creative. If you are not creative enough, if you're not brave enough to challenge. Uh, what you study in school, if you're not brave enough to challenge your uh, boss or like the society to create something new, then AI will do your job. So yeah, I think it just like be authentic, explore, be brave, and like don't take um, don't take the world as a rule. The world will only rule you if you are not following your own path. If you're not like trying to be authentic, that's a little bit. I don't know. I do. I, I don't want to sound a little bit cheesy, but it's true. Actually, you have to be very authentic to yourself, true to yourself, to kind of be able to create something that's that's novel or something that you at least you're happy with. You don't 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 mind the world and what it likes and what the, what it doesn't like. Just like do something that you're happy with. Of course. So what are your uh, focus points right now? Are you working on any project, uh, doing an AI project or something? Can, can you tell us a little bit what is, what, is, what is your main focus these days? It's, it's all over the place. So it's, it's been a, a very crazy summer. I, um, so so, our... as, uh, so as, as someone who's mastering this uh, art of engineering, are you doing any uh, AI related projects like uh, design and architecture, not like AI, a a LLM, some kind of this kind of stuff, but I don't think it's architecture. So I just finished the project. It's a design project, which actually like musically generating AI concepts and then turning them into 3D geometry, but it's not architectures, but it's like design again. 
I just finished it, but I don't know. Like they are facing problems with fabrication. It was a cool project because I got to integrate AI as a concept into like the process of design. And yeah, this yeah, I'm really actually frustrated that it's not done by now. It would have been like one of the first projects where you turn AI into 3D. I, and I did that like a few months ago. But yeah, and yeah, I've did I've did a couple of branding projects that's basically using AI, whether like it's generating images or like also generating vi videos. So yeah, there is uh, one uh, project that should be released in January, which is like, uh, this was pretty cool because I trained a library of pre-existing renderings for 3D Max, and then I created a video based on these images. Uh, I don't know, do you know my videos, like, you know, the AI, the stable diffusion, AI videos? So yeah, so it's it was really cool because now, like, you're trying to plan, like, you know, realistic, like, it's more controlled AI, basically. Training your own small models and then applying video. So this one is coming in January. I'm also like I'm doing a lot of exhibitions. So uh, yeah, I have two running exhibitions now, one in Cairo and one in Taipei. And uh, I have two other exhibitions in Rotterdam and in Dubai. Um, I was working uh, as a conceptual artist in a movie. Um, this project keeps like coming up and down. Like sometimes, like I, I used to work on it, but then it came to a halt and now it might go back again. So I'm not sure. Um, yeah, there are like, I done like also like three or four projects like that kind of, uh, it's all AI right now what I'm using, or at least AI import, uh, to it. So yeah, but I'm more, more interested now in like art actually more than design and architecture. So that's something that I want to work a little bit more on. And it's really interesting that now my, my artworks or like using AI are now, being displayed in in photography exhibitions they are not displayed in digital art and uh I, it's i don't know how to like i i take that as a big compliment actually because now it's like i am getting out of like this whole ai artist you know it's like now i'm like like and even like people who are inviting me to these exhibitions they are like letting me know like they are talking to me and i tell them hey you know that i'm doing ai right you're a photography uh, gallery why are you why do you want to deal with me and they say like like what i'm doing is part of like a a way to like basically like it's a photograph it's a storytelling it's like a photo collage basically and uh i i'm really happy with that and i think and i don't know if there's anybody out there who's using ai who's displaying their work in photography exhibitions i know there's a lot of like ai um digital art exhibitions but but like AI in photography, that's, I don't know. I'm, I'm really interested to see how people will react to my two upcoming exhibitions like next year. Should be interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's great. Uh, no, you've been focused on so many things. Uh, and this is a great, this is a great uh, path that you're going, definitely. And you're one of the, you were one of the first people who are, at the forefront of this uh, AI uh, movement in architecture and creative industry. And a lot of people are looking at your works as well. And uh, you're being a kind of role model for the younger generation yeah. as well. <laughs> so so uh, you're, you're working uh, as a freelancer probably uh, on, on these projects. And uh, now you have... You have your own studio, probably, in, in California. Yeah, well, I I have it in my own studio. It's still unofficial. I don't know. Like, I still... I didn't have time to work on my branding and all these logistic stuff. I I even I don't even have time to update my website, which is very unfortunate. So, yeah, I, I kind of have my own studio. I have to say I have my own studio, but it's still, like... i still working on, like, making it, like, more cohesive like bringing more people and this is like the challenging part uh, of the business and but the most challenging part is like i have to learn something new every day like the tools are like getting uh like being up like the base of like development of these tools is just crazy and it's very exhausting and uh, yeah what are your day-to-day -day ai tools that you're using so yeah um i'm trying to really invest in conf ui i think conf ui is the 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 future AI professional tool. So I I don't know if you've used it, but it's basically it's like a node base. So it's like Grasshopper. I think like I you I think uh, I don't know uh, Carlos have teached like a little comfy in order. 
Yes, Carlos. Carlos taught yeah, Car UI in uh, one of his pro his uh, his workshops. Yeah, probably taking control three. Yeah, it was. Yes. yeah. I saw Conf UI. Yes. Yeah, it was amazing. It's, yeah, I think it it's was amazing. really. It's really professional. It's now like you really get the essence. Like there's the misconception about AI um, work that is like easy, that it's lazy, that it's cheap. But with Confu UI, you really understand, okay, no, that's a profession. That's a technicality that nobody, not a lot of people can master. This is like really challenging. Like with Midjourney, anybody can create like a, like a beautiful image, but not everybody can create a good image. In Confu UI, it's both. Like you have to be really good to create a beautiful and a good image. So yeah, so Confu UI is one of the tools that I'm using. I've been I've used a lot of tools. I'm trying to try almost every tool that's out there. I've started to use like um, Runway ML a little bit more. Uh, PCAL apps are like, like their updates are really, really good. So I'm trying to integrate that into my workflow. These are video, um, a text to video or like image to video tools. Uh, Midjourney, of course. They will release uh, V6, and I'm like, I've saw the ratings of the images. Oh, yeah, V6. yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. It's, I think it's soon. That's a huge yeah, step yeah, yeah. forward. Yeah, and that's that's For something them. that's really interesting because you see, there's a little like the hype about like mid journey and the mid journey images. You can see like it started to like to drown on Instagram. Like not a lot of people are interested in mid journey right now. I think the hype will come back again with V6, and this is a very interesting observation over how the tools are like controlling our aesthetics and controlling our direction to what is good and what's bad and what tools are we using in general. It's I, I I'm not I I'm not sure I don't think it's a good thing in a way. But anyway, it's just something that we think about. Uh, I I. I... Yeah, I I, uh, I had conversation with some architects before, and I some of them have mentioned this uh, as Uberization factor, uh, which uh, the 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 example of this is uh, automotive industry hasn't been changed by BMW or uh, Mercedes. It's been changed by Uber or a tech company. And this tech, these tech companies are affecting architecture as well. Uh, with all these tools that we're having in architecture, none of them were designed for architects, and none of them are were designed by architects or were planned by architects. So, architecture is getting huge impacts by tech technology these days, and non-architects. So, right now we're seeing its effects as well. Maybe they have architecture team inside the inside their uh, you know teams departments i don't think so david who's <laughs> it, 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 david who's there like 10 15 people uh, yeah i don't think they're a big team maybe they're bigger now i don't know but what i'm sure about is that these are not ai these are not architectural tools at all so, so like the developers are not are far away from making it like related to architecture in any way i think like as architects, you know, like everybody that we talk to, I think we live in a bubble. And this bubble is... Exactly. And you don't see, like, the bigger picture. Like, there are a lot of, like, the 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 amount of images that are being created and videos that are being created by artists or, we like, actual users. I, like, and... some, a lot of people are not artists. They are just users. And they are saying, like, hey, this is art. But uh, maybe I'm one of them. I don't know. But the thing is, is, like... We live in a small bubble and we think like, hey, like these tools and are affecting the future of architecture. And it does. But there's a bigger picture, you know, and this picture is like it's impacting our work and it's banking architecture, impacting our uh, perceptions about the world. So it's I think AI, what's really good about AI, at least for me, is that it's really helping me look at the bigger picture. Like right now, I don't really care to focus on something, but now I see the world as like. I don't know, like in a very connected, very chaotic way, where now you can see, okay, that I didn't know that before. I didn't know that will that will have that impact on this. You know, it's like growing up. I don't know. It's making me like growing up mentally, not in a good way, but like you see things <laughs> that you don't want to see. But it's like I think that's the power of AI. It's just like it's broader your perspective. You know, like you 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 understand more. At least for me, I don't know. What is your why are you using AI? 
you mentioned this, but I think I, I want to hear more. Why are you using AI? I'm using AI to explore and to like challenge architecture, question the status quo of architecture. I think like the current architecture scene is not helping anybody, not the architects, not the people, not anybody. And with the tool, we keep developing on the tools that we're developing and we don't think too much about how we are developing them. We don't understand AI. Nobody understands how AI works, uh, whether in architecture or, like, or any other practice. And there's a lot of things that could go wrong, not only in architecture, but like, you know, with everything. The existential risks from using technology is we are like looking down on them. We do not like paying enough attention about what could go wrong with using AI. But if we're talking about architecture, like we need to really be very careful about how we are designing what we're designing right now at the moment, not not to think about the future. I think like the future will be figured out at one point. And I think like, yeah, it's always great to look at the future, but it's more important to question the present and the past because we are operating based on some rules and some stereotypes that are just like 80 or 100 years old. The world hasn't always been modern. We didn't always build walls like that. We didn't always use concrete. And it's not about formal dysfunction. It's not about capital. It's not about money. So, and it's not about like the future won't be all green buildings. That's utopia. That's not going to happen. Because if you really want to predict the future, you need to understand the present and the past. And basically, that's why I'm using AI. I, I'm, if I am reflecting in, on my work on the future sometimes, it's more of like reflecting on the present based on like past events or past history. So Yeah. By using AI, do you feel like alienated? Mm, how so? What do you mean by alienated? Like, uh, I don't know. There's this... Uh something that is helping you or somehow uh something that didn't exist uh, it doesn't exist but it's in in codes is there any i don't know sentient or have been have you had the feeling of are you talking with the uh, talking an alien or something <laughs> you had the feeling of you're talking with an alien <laughs> with ai i mean uh, let me answer you this in a way. <laughs> oh, all, all the time, all that. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, well, it's not an. Well, it's it's actually before that. Like when I before while I was using like 3ds Max and Grasshopper, I always talked to them. I always felt like there's a connection. Like most of like the my the the designs that I created that I found interesting, it wasn't because I really intended to do it that way. But sometimes I will do a mistake, like I make a rotation, the wrong rotation, and then I see a new perspective. And it's like, it's trying to tell me something. That's actually how I, that's why I like software. Like, I really like Grasshopper because I feel like it's a friend. It's like it's collaborating with me. But not not in a sense of like being alien, but it's just like something that's really, really interesting. Some Like a, like a good conversation with like a very small person. With the eye, it kind of extended a little bit more because now you have a more imaginative friend you have a, something that will show you a new thing that you never thought about before it's 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 there in your mind something that you wanted but you never you were able you were you were never able to visualize it that way you know so i don't think it's alien no it is it's actually i think working with ai is actually like communicating with the entire humanity because AI is is just trained on. Uh, my question about alienated was because uh, I had we had a conversation with a written conversation with uh, Neil Leach, and he calls AI as uh, alien intelligence. I don't agree with that. So, I don't agree with that. I think, uh, have you? Yeah. Or maybe I don't know. Maybe we should. Maybe I. Maybe I need to think about it because intelligence is the ability to learn, basically. Maybe that's how. So I think in that sense, so yeah, basically, maybe that's an alien intelligence in terms of how it's learning or how or its capacity to kind of develop. However, like AI is basically, it's, it's called neural networks. It was designed uh, as a simulation to the neurons in the brain, right? And it's being trained on human data. 
So for me, it's actually not alien. It's just a different way to understand our own history or to understand our own complexity. If you're talking about an alien, then they will have very different perspectives about the world that we know, maybe about physics too, I don't know. But like AI is is partially human. It's in big part, it's human. It was created by humans. It was trained by humans. And the data set is, is human knowledge. So for me, it's like I'm talking to, when I talk to, when I'm using AI, I feel like I'm talking to everyone. Not, and, and this is not an alien that, yeah. Exactly. It's it's like, yeah, you're communicating with the past, you're communicating with the future. Even, like, we are training our models the together. Whole collective knowledge. Yeah, yeah the whole like, it's like, you know, like, in a way, if you're using Midjourney and, like, say, like, uh, Carlos or Joshua or, like, Andrew Cudless or, like, all these people, we are building something together. And there is a connection that we can see, that you can see in our outputs. You know, some of the results that I get it will look like, hey, maybe Carlos created that, or maybe someone else created that, you know. So it's it's a way to communicate with everyone. I I don't think it's alien at all, and it's really the, maybe it's also dangerous to think about it that way, because that means that we are increasing the bridge or the gap between us and our tools, and that could pose an existential risk on how we see the machine. Oh, that, I think that I think that gap but is going to be a huge. That's why we need to be very like you know we need to stick to like human morals to be like empathetic to let go of our ego to like you know to become more I don't know nicer to each other and to the tools that we're using and to stop think about like I don't know I'll I'll become really really utopian at that point or like I don't know like uh, maybe unrealistic but I think we should really invest on becoming better human beings before using AI. Like yeah, if we get a, an a, like if we ever have a bad version of the AI, it's because we are ourselves are bad. It's not the fault of AI; it will be our fault. If the AI is alien, it's because we're treating it as such, or like we are using it in such a manner. That's that's my point. Of view. Uh, do you have any other words, the final words that you would like to share with young creatives? Yeah, I think that, like I don't know if. As uh, if I was younger, I wouldn't. I would like allow myself to explore more and understand the world a little bit more, not to just try to be an intern in a in a in a big company or like to just go study uh, in a program and then like leave the program behind and then like face the world. Of course, like go study, do your internships, whatever you want to do. However, just try to keep an open mind for like during your 20s 30s probably like during your entire life because you don't have to figure things out right now like th you will figure it out by time you, there is no rush you need take your time on like understanding the world take your time to explore take your time to you know understand your 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 identity take the time to criticize what you're what you're doing right now don't be too hard on yourself and yeah just like you know there's a lot of stress that is going on with like the younger generations. Every time I talk with people, they're just like very edgy because of social media and because of like there's the pressure that they need to like make it in the world. And this is a false like you know like believe me, this is a false impression. This is not something that is good for you. Nobody kind of nobody knows it all. Every time everybody needs to take their time in their life. So just take it easy and like and explore and you know. Yeah, be happy, you know, like, yeah. Well, well, thank you so much, Hassan. This was a really great conversation. I loved it. Yeah, looking forward uh, for more collaborations in the future. Thanks for joining PA Talks. Yeah, yeah, always great to talk with you, Hamid. Thank you so much for having me.